Hello and welcome to Nitrania Game Club. My name is Branislav Berec and you're watching Game in a Nutshell, the series of videos designed to explain rules of various board games. Today we're going to learn how to play Domination, a game designed by Wei Cheng Cheng. It's actually the re-implementation of his previous game called Mini World War II. And the game will be published by Falang Studios and it's coming to Kickstarter soon. The game is for two to four players, primarily for four, but it also can be played in a three player game or as a two player game. And before we start, everything you're about to see in this video is a prototype version. All the components are prototype, all the cards are prototype version. So let's get started. Place the game board in the middle of the table. Each player will take a player board and place these color cubes on the technological tree. Each player would choose a power and take all units of that power. German power consists of German units and Italian units. UK power contains UK units, US units and French units. Japanese power only has Japanese units and Russian power has Russian units and Chinese units. Note that players have to sit in this exact order. Place these neutral armies, damage markers and resistant tokens next to the game board, together with these France and Italy tiles. Place the round marker on the first spot of this round track to the year 1939. The allies join war markers to the zero space of their corresponding tracks. Victory point markers on the initial spaces of the scoring track and take these four US cards and two Chinese cards distinguished by the green and blue color at the bottom of those cards, shuffle them and place them face down on their respective spaces. Then take all the remaining cards, shuffle them and place them face down as the draw deck. This area is reserved for the discard deck. Then following these symbols in the areas on the game board, Place starting units of all powers and also the neutral starting units on each area with such symbol. So this is how the board should look like when you're done with the setup. Experienced players may use the advanced setup which you can find in the rulebook. The game is played in rounds representing the calendar years. Each round has three phases. In the first phase, the strategic phase, players will draw and draft these cards that will be used for operations. Then in the second phase, the action phase, players will use these operation points or technology symbols or these special icons for various actions in the game. They will deploy new units on the board, they will move units, attack and destroy enemy units and they will develop their technology boards for more efficient actions. And then in the third phase, the administration phase, Players will check for victory and then they will clean up and prepare the board for the next round. Domination is a team versus team game. The USSR player and the UK player play together against the Japanese and German player. To calculate the team score, add the USSR and the UK score together and then the German and Japanese score. The score is checked at the end of each round and the conditions for the victory are depicted on the game board. These conditions change every year. The number of victory points needed for the Axis Coalition decreases year by year, but for the Allies it increases every year. So while in 1939 both coalitions need 32 points to win the game, in 1941 the Axis Coalition only needs 30 points to win the game, but the Allied players need 34 points to win the game. Players score victory points for controlling the areas with these stars and each star is worth one victory point. Then they score victory points for developing technologies of different colors and they also score victory points for these diplomatic cards. In the first phase, the strategic phase, players will draft the cards. First, draw the number of cards indicated above the current year and in 1939, German player will take 5 cards instead of 4 and in 1941, the Japanese player will also take 5 cards instead of 4. If the draw deck ever runs out, reshuffle the discard pile. After drawing the cards, players will now perform the draft. First, 
Each player will secretly inspect their cards, then they will choose one of those cards and set it aside face down in front of them. Since the German player took one more card in the first year of the game, that player will also choose and set aside one additional card only in the first round of the draft. Now all the remaining cards that players have in their hand will be rotated in the clockwise direction. Notice that all players will now pass the same number of cards to other players. The passing will look like this. And now, starting with this second round of the draft, each player will only set aside one card. After players are done selecting their second card, they will again rotate the cards clockwise. Now, with these last two cards, you have to choose and keep one of them and discard the other. Discarded cards are placed on the discard pile. Then, when the draft is over, each player in a player order may decide to discard one card and draw the new card as a replacement. When all players would be done with this discard and the draw step, the strategic phase is over. In the second phase, the action phase, players take turns starting with the first player and then continuing in a clockwise direction. The first player of each round is determined by the color on this round track. So in the first round, it's the German player as the first player, in the second round, the UK player, then the Japanese, USSR player, and again, the German, UK, and the Japanese player. On your turn, you can either play one of your cards from your hand, or you can pass, but with that, your round is over. You can use the cards in multiple ways. You can use these operation points in the top left corner on the cards, to perform operations which are depicted on your player board. You can deploy new units, move those units, destroy enemy units, or launch rockets and airstrikes. Or you can use these technology icons in the top right corner to develop the technology on your player board. Or you can use these icons at the bottom of the card to perform events, but only if the color of that card matches the color of your power. Allied players, so that's only the UK and the USSR player, can decide to discard one of their cards to perform the land lease action and move the allies join war marker one step forward. When the marker reaches the end space, in this case US joins the war and in this case China would join the war. If you have no cards in your hand or if you do have some cards but you don't want to play any more cards, you must pass. Now I will describe all these actions in more detail. When you use cards for operations, you gain number of operation points in the top left corner. You can spend these operation points on any actions or combinations of actions on your player board. So for example, with these six points, you can deploy two units or you can deploy and move the units or you can deploy a land unit and destroy the enemy vessel and so on and so forth. The costs of these actions can be reduced by developing these technologies. You can spend operation points from the card to deploy new units. There are several types of units. These are armies, these are fleets, air fleets, and German player also has these U-boots or submarines. With this brown action and for the cost of three operation points, you can deploy one army or an air fleet on the home area with this factory symbol. Home area is any area with the borders of the same color as your power. So these dark gray areas are German home areas. This black area is the Italian home area. These are USSR home areas. These are UK home areas and so on and so forth. With this blue action and three operation points, you can deploy one fleet on your home area with this shipyard symbol. Now, each area can only contain units of one power or one player, including allies and coalition partners. That means that this Italian army can be in the same area as the German units. Areas with one or two stars can only contain maximum two units. 
Areas with three stars can contain maximum four units. Armies can be stacked in these square land areas or these octagonal coastal areas. Fleets can only be stacked in these circular island areas or again in the octagonal coastal areas. Air fleets can be stacked in any areas, obviously respecting the stacking limit. However, players can have maximum one air fleet on the game board at the same time, and the air fleets can never stand alone. They always have to be in an area with another unit. There's only one exception to this rule. Air fleets can stand alone only in their home areas. Only the German player can spend two operation points and deploy the U-boot. They can only deploy them in one of these two areas, and each area can contain maximum two U-boots. However, in 1939, only one U-boot can be on the game board. In 1940, two U-boots can be on the game board. And starting with 1941, there's no limit to the number of U-boots that can be placed on the game board. If the home area contains this damage marker, or even any enemy units, you may not deploy units in this area. You may spend operation points from the card to destroy one enemy unit, or it can also be the neutral army, and by destroying a unit, you can remove the unit from an area which is adjacent to your attacking unit. Your attacking unit must be in supply, which means it has to be connected to your home area. So there must be a continuous path of areas controlled by that player from the attacking unit to the home area. And the home area must also be controlled by that player or it must be without the enemy units. If the attacking unit would not be in supply, that unit would not be allowed to attack. With this brown action and three operation points, you can destroy one army or one air fleet, but you can only destroy air fleet if it's the last unit in the area. With this blue action and three operation points, you can destroy a fleet. To destroy U-boots, you have to have a fleet in the same area, and you need to spend two operation points. Areas which contain U-boots are not controlled by anyone, which means U-boots break the in-supply line. So this UK fleet is not in supply. This fleet, although the area is not controlled by anyone, is adjacent to area which is in supply, and that means this fleet can attack this U-boot. The same rules apply to these resistance units. In order to destroy a unit, you have to have your unit in the same area and you need to spend two operation points. Note that you need to spend operation points based on the unit which you want to destroy and not based on the unit which is attacking. You can spend operation points from the card to move one of your units. The unit you want to move must be in supply and then you can move it to any other in supply area or to any empty area which is adjacent to one of your in supply areas. You can only move along these brown or blue arrows, so that means there's no connection between these two areas. And you can also move along these colored triangles which are considered to be land links, so something like these brown arrows. When you move into an unoccupied area and you move through this brown link or through this colored triangle, the first unit you move there must be an army unit. Then later on, even though it's a brown link, it's a coastal area, you can also move ships there since it's no longer an unoccupied area. Similarly, if you would move into an unoccupied area through the blue link, the first unit you move there must be fleet unit. However, you can never make a move which would make one of your units become out of supply. When you move units, you may move them through any number of in-supply areas of any type. So you can even move armies through these island areas or you can move ships through land areas. You must respect the rules for stacking in the destination area. So armies can only be stacked in coastal or land areas and ships can only be stacked in the island or coastal areas. 
In addition, the stacking limit in the areas with one or two stars is only two units, and four units in the areas with three stars. You can move the units through areas which contain your allies or your coalition partners, and you can even stack them together. However, in this example, remember if there was any U-boot in the area, the U-boot would break the in-supply line. You may only move through the area with your allies if that allied joined the war already. Otherwise, those areas would be inaccessible. You may never move through an area which contains the units of another power, not even your teammate, and you may never move into empty areas, empty homeland areas of your teammate. If you move into a homeland area of another power, and that area only contains the air fleet, that air fleet is immediately destroyed. If you move into a homeland area which is able to produce units, place the damage marker to that area, and that area may not produce units. To place a damage marker to the capital city, you need to have two units in that capital. You can only move U-boots between these two indicated areas, and they don't have to be in supply, and maximum two U-boots can be in one area. You may never move the resistance units. When you move your air fleet, flip it upside down to indicate that it was used this round. It cannot be used for any other action this round. If you have developed the rocketry technology, you can launch one rocket per round, and it can be the rocket of any type you have developed. To do that, discard the card from your hand, and to launch this rocket or this one, you have to discard the card with five operation points at least. So in this example, it could be this one or this one. If you have developed this technology, to launch this rocket, you would have to discard the card with a minimum value of 6 operation points. When you launch a rocket, you have to choose an opponent, and that opponent will have to discard certain number of cards from their hand. When you launch this rocket, the opponent has to discard one random card from their hand. If you launch this rocket, the opponent has to discard two cards, and with this rocket, they have to discard three random cards from their hand. Remember, you can only launch one rocket per round. If you have an air fleet in supply and that air fleet has not been used this round yet, you can use it to perform the airstrike action. With that, you can attack and destroy enemy unit which is two spaces away from that air fleet. Based on the unit type you want to destroy, determine the operation points you need to spend. So for armies and air fleets it's this value, and for fleets it would be this value, and then discard the card with the same or higher value. That's the only thing you can do with that card, you may not use the remaining points for any other actions with that card. However, you destroy an enemy unit which is two spaces away. Again, to indicate that the air fleet has been used this round, flip it upside down. If you cannot or don't want to spend all the operation points from the card, let's say in this example I have 5 operation points and I make 2 moves with my armies, which costs 4 operation points, you can rotate that card 90 degrees and preserve exactly 1 operation point, never more than 1. Then later in the round, when you play other cards for operation points, you can add 1 point from this preserved card to the operation value of the card you are using at the moment. When you do, discard that preserved card. You may not preserve a card which you use for launching a rocket or for an airstrike. Such card is always discarded. Then, when you preserve a card, you have to use that card in the same round, otherwise it will be lost at the end of the turn. In addition, at any time during the game, you can have maximum one card preserved. There are five different types of technologies. This is Army, Logistics, Navy, Rocketry and Electronics. Each card has one of those icons in the top right corner. When you play a card for technology, you can develop the technology which is depicted in the top right corner of that card. 
To do that, place the card face down next to your player board and you will reveal that card during the administration phase at the end of the round and only then that technology will become active. We'll get to that later in the video. When you develop the technology, you will either remove the cube from the player board or sometimes you will move the cube to these spots on your player board that will reduce the cost of taking that action. Each player can develop maximum one technology card per round. This white cube tracks the victory points for developing the technologies and you can score these points by developing technologies of different colors. For one color developed, you get no victory points. If you develop the technologies of two different colors, you get one victory point. When you develop the technology of a third color, you would score two victory points at the end of the game. And when you develop the technology of fourth or fifth color, you would score three or four victory points respectively. I will go through all the technologies very briefly now. You can find the complete description in the rulebook. When you develop any of these six technologies, you move the cube to the corresponding action space and with that you reduce the cost of that operation. So you can reduce the cost of moving your units, you can reduce the cost of destroying enemy units and you can also reduce the cost of deploying your own units to your home territories. When you develop this technology, which is called radar, the cube is completely removed from the game and this technology is a defense against rocketry technologies. If any player would launch a rocket at you, with radar you can reduce the number of discarded cards by one. Now, when you develop this or this technology, you reduce the cost of destroying enemy units even more. And notice, you can only develop this technology if you have developed these three technologies before. Now, after developing this technology, as this icon indicates, destroying ships in the coastal areas, which is indicated by this octagonal icon here, only costs two operation points. That can be further reduced by discounts on the action itself. So in the current situation, destroying enemy ships in coastal areas would cost this player only one operation point. You can only develop this heavy bomber technology if you have developed these two logistics technologies before. And this one allows you to deploy the second air fleet on the game board. This is a rocketry technology, which allows you to launch rockets at your enemies, which I already described in the operations section of the video. And when you develop that technology, simply remove the cube from the player board. Now, in order to develop the second level of this rocketry technology, you have to have the first level developed, obviously, and then one of these two purple technologies. So either espionage, or Enigma technology. You don't have to have developed both of these technologies to develop the second level of rocketry. This espionage technology allows you to take another step during the first strategic phase of the game. After players are done drafting cards and discarding and drawing another card, each player with this espionage technology developed in a player order may look at three random cards from one of their opponents and discard one of those cards and the opponent would draw another card as a replacement. So with this espionage technology you can discard a powerful card from an opponent's hand. And finally this enigma technology also affects the strategic phase. When players are finished drafting they can choose one card from their hand, discard that card and draw a new card as a replacement. With enigma technology you would draw two cards, keep one of them and discard the other. If you have a card with the same color as the color of your power, so in this example it's a German player with the dark gray color at the bottom of the card, you can use that card for events. After allies join war, the UK player can also use the US cards for events and the Russian player may use these Chinese cards for events. When you play this tactics event, take the card and place it in front of any player. It could be you, it could be your teammate, it could also be your opponent, but that wouldn't really make sense, because this event increases the operation points value of all other cards the player with that card will play that round by one. 
So essentially you can increase the operation points value of your cards for the rest of the round. The second type of the tactics event with the minus one symbol reduces the operation points value of all other cards by one. So you want to take this card and place it in front of your opponents. And finally, the third type of tactics event gives you immediate number of operation points, which is usually one point higher than the basic value of that card. So essentially, if this card has the color of your power, the operation value of that card is increased by one for you. After using that card, it has to be discarded. But this kind of event, the logistics event, you can deploy new units and move units, and you can only deploy units which are depicted on that card, and you can use these actions in any order you want. But you can deploy any unit which belongs to your power. So this German player could deploy the German army, but also the Italian army. When you move units, you can move any of your units on the game board, not just the ones that you have just deployed with this event. Remember, when deploying the Italian army, it can only be deployed to Italian home territory, and when deploying German armies, they can be only deployed to German home territory. This event, the puppet event, can only be played by Axis player, so either German or Japanese player. It allows them to place two army units to two different neutral areas where that player already has at least one of their units. It's a special way of deploying units for the Axis players. And finally, this event, the uh, resistance event, can only be played by allied players. And in this example, since the card is yellow, it will be played by the UK player. And this event allows the allied player to deploy up to three resistance units in a non-homeland area controlled by Axis player. You can either deploy all of them into one area or you can split them into two or even three different non-homeland areas controlled by the Axis player. Every resistance unit reduces the victory points of that area by one, but it can never be less than zero. The area with the resistant unit is still in supply area and the resistant unit can be destroyed by Axis army if that army is in the same area as that resistance unit. This action costs two operation points. If the Axis player leaves the area with the resistance units, those units stay in that area and then when the allied player enters such area, the resistance units will be removed. These events are diplomacy events. When you play that card and it's the only diplomacy event with that flag, place it next to your player board and score the victory points immediately. However, when there is another card with the same flag on the table, if the new card has higher value, the old card is removed from the play and the new card stays on the table. If the new card has lower value than the old card, both cards are discarded. And if the new card has the same value as the old card, both cards remain in play. However, in this situation, when the Japanese player would play this card, both of these cards would be discarded. When playing these diplomacy events and potentially removing other diplomacy cards from the table, don't forget to adjust the victory point markers on the scoring track. And finally, this event allows you to develop new technology if you have not developed technology yet this round, but instead of using the symbol in the top right corner of that card, you can choose any card from the discard pile. Place the chosen card face down next to your player board and discard the event card. The allied players, so it's USSR or in this case UK player, can discard one card to perform the land lease action and move the allies join war marker one step forward. Since this was the UK player, that player moves the US marker one step forward. The USSR player would move the China marker. Each player can perform this action only once per round. After discarding the card that was used for the action, the UK player would draw one US card and the USSR player would draw one China card and set this card aside next to their player board. You will take that card into your hand at the start of the next strategic phase 
So it is similar to German player drawing one more card in the first round of the game or Japanese player drawing one more card in the third round of the game. When the marker reaches the end space, in this situation the US would join the war and it would become part of the UK power. The same applies to China. If the marker reaches the end space, the China enters the war and it becomes part of the USSR power. The UK player can now use the US units as if they were the UK units. You can stack them together, you can move through these areas. However, when deploying new units, UK units can only be deployed into UK areas and US units into US home areas. The same applies for USSR and China. Once the US is at war, UK player may no longer play this land lease action. And again, the same applies to USSR player once China enters the war. There's one more complication for the UK player. If there is one U-boot on the game board, to take this land lease action, the UK player must use the card with the operation value of at least four. When two U-boots would be on the game board, the minimum operational value of the card would be five points. And with three U-boots on the game board, the UK player would have to discard the card with the value of minimum six operational points. Whenever the Axis unit destroys a Chinese unit, move the marker one step forward and take one card from the China deck and shuffle it into the draw deck. Whenever the Axis unit moves into the Chinese home area, do the same thing. Move the marker one step forward and take the card and shuffle it into the draw deck. So the Allies Joint War marker can move several steps during one round and it can also result in that ally joining the war. Again, the same applies to US. If you have no cards in hand, or even if you do but you don't want to play more cards, you must pass. If you didn't play all your cards, you can take one card, set it aside and you will take that card at the start of next round and discard all other cards. If you took the land lease action during the round, and so you have one card set aside already, then you may not keep any other card when you pass. Once you pass, you may no longer perform any action. When all players pass, proceed to the administration phase. The administration phase has several steps which you have to take in this exact order. First, check for the victory conditions. Sum up the points of both factions, so the UK and the USSR player against German and Japanese player, and players gain points for first controlling the areas, and you control the area either when you have a unit in that area, or if it's your home territory and there are no units there. For an area with one star, you get one point, for the area with two stars, you get two points, and three points for the capitals. If you have one enemy unit in your capital, then no one controls that capital city. If there are two or more enemy units in your capital city, it is controlled by that player and that player scores those three victory points. Submarines or U-boots and resistant units cannot control any area. And remember, if there is a U-boot in the area, that area is not controlled by anyone. Then add the victory points for your technologies and also for any diplomacy cards which you have on the table. If the faction reaches the indicated number of victory points for a given year, it wins the game. This threshold increases every year for allied players and decreases every year for the Axis players. Then in the second step, the coalition partners may switch factions. If Axis player controls France, France becomes the coalition partner of that player. Remove all French units from the game board and move them to that Axis player and place this tile on the France area. Place it with this dark grey side up if it's controlled by German player and if it will be controlled by Japanese player, place it with this white side up. If later in the game the UK player would regain control of France, then in the next administration phase, remove the France tile from the map and return all French units back to the UK player. The same applies to Italy and the Allied player. Then in the next step, remove these damage markers from your home area if that home area is back under your control. 
Remember, if there are no units in your home area, you are again back in control of that area. Then in the next step, players can perform strategic bombing in player order. If the player has an unused air fleet, and that air fleet is maximum two spaces away from any home area with the production symbols, the attacking player may place a damage marker to that area, which means this area would not be allowed to produce units, at least not until the next administration phase. As you can see, you can place that damage marker even to the capital city. Then flip the air fleet upside down to indicate that it was used this round. Strategic bombing is not mandatory, you don't have to do it. Then in the next step, all players refresh all their air fleets. You can also refresh your rockets in case you took the launch the rocket action this round. Then immediately after that, switch any technology cards that you played this round. That technology now becomes available. Finally, advance the route marker to the next year. Let me now briefly explain the small adjustments to the strategic phase for the second round and for all subsequent rounds. First of all, draw the indicated number of cards from the draw deck. Don't forget that the Japanese player would take 5 cards in 1941. Then, if any player would have any card set aside from previous round, that player would take that card into their hand now. Then, in the first turn of the draft, Players normally choose and keep one card. However, those players who took this additional card from the previous round, they have to choose and keep two cards. In a special case in 1941, when the Japanese player would draw five cards instead of four, which is already one more card than other players, and if that player would also have a card set aside from previous round, he would have six cards in total. Now, while all other players would have to choose and keep one card during the first turn of the draft, the Japanese player, in addition to the one card, which is a standard card for the draft, he would have to choose and keep one more because he drew one more and then one additional, which was set aside from the previous round. Only then, all players would pass the same number of cards to the next player. After that, the rest of this draft phase is the same as in the first round. Then after the draft is finished, in the next step, players may choose one card from their hand, discard that card, and draw a new card. However, if the player has this Enigma technology discovered, they can draw two cards instead, choose one, keep the one card, and discard the other. After that, there is another step, the spy step, which is played in a player order, and all players who have developed this espionage technology can use it now. In a two-player game, each player plays both powers of one faction. In the strategic phase, draw the number of cards equal to the total value of both powers together decreased by one. So in the first round of the game, when both allied players should draw four cards, that's eight total, minus one, seven cards. Japanese power would also draw four cards, German power would draw five, which is nine, minus one, eight cards. Each player would take all the cards for both powers together, and then during the draft phase, players would normally choose and keep two cards, and again, if you would preserve a card from the previous round, or if the German power in 1939 or the Japanese in 1941 would draw one additional card because of the year, that player would choose and keep one additional card. Then they would pass the cards to each other, and starting with the second round, both players would choose and keep two cards. Then during the action phase, each power acts independently as if played by two different players, and also the technologies have to be developed separately for both powers, but the player holds all the cards together, obviously respecting the rule that if, for example, the USSR player wants to play an event, they have to use the USSR card. The three-player game works in the exact same way as a four-player game, with one exception that one player has to play for both powers of one faction. However, they have to play these powers totally independently 
keep two separate hands of cards as if those two powers would be played by two different players. So that's how you play Domination. If you have any questions or comments, please put them into the comment section below. I'll be happy to answer your questions. If you like the series, please subscribe. My name is Branislav Berec. You've been watching Game in a Nutshell and hope to see you next time.